Good morning. Uh, my name is Abby Goddard. I'm an international relations major, and I'm also minoring in anthropology. So throughout my studies, I've learned a lot about the importance of nationalism, because it's really an incredible force in international relations in the way that it determines interstate and intrastate policy. Um, and there are you know, thousands of nationalist movements across the world. And one that I decided to focus on is the Basque nationalist movement in Spain. Because um, increasingly in international relations, nationalist movements have access to international institutions and international courts to help protect and defend their rights and their cultural values on an international level and really be able to act on a more even playing field with states. Um, so I was interested in looking at the way in which the European court is a forum for the intersection of international law and culture to see how it can mediate a conflict that arises between a nationalist movement and the state that it belongs to. Um, so because of that, my research question in general is how does the European Court of Human Rights mediate the conflict between the Basque nationalists and the Spanish state? Um, and the way that I said about answering this question is through a case study of three different court cases that have gone to the European Court of Human Rights in the past 15 years that have featured a Basque nationalist applicant. Um, and then with these court decisions, I've analyzed them to look at the relationship between what the court says and how it corresponds to different nationalist myth, basically how it supports or encourages or even discourages in some um, points part of the nationalist ideology to see how they are supported or encouraged in their quest for independence or greater autonomy. And then with those court decisions, I did a little bit of analysis of the court's approach to this conflict and the impact that it has had um, on the political conflict that has evolved in the past 15 years. Um, so as a little bit of overview, the Basque region is in the northern part of Spain and the southwestern part of France. Um, the historical territory that Basque nationalists rely on are seven different provinces that are listed here. Three are in France, four in Spain. Um, and the three leftern provinces, Vizcaya, Guizpoca, and Alava, um, are part of the Basque country autonomous community, which is a political entity in Spain right now. And then Navarre is its own autonomous community, but ethnically they are both considered Basque. Um, the Basque region was incorporated into the Spanish state in 1876 when the fueros, which are local laws and rules, were officially abolished by the Spanish monarchy. Um, before this point, the fueros really ruled the political and economic functioning of the region. Um, so this date is really considered the loss of total independence for the Basque nation and the point where they became subjected to the rule of Spain. Um, the Basque nationalists consider themselves ethnically, culturally, and linguistically distinct. The Basque language is called Euskara. It has absolutely no relation to any other language in Europe. They have no idea where it came from. A lot of people suspect it came from the Caucasus like 10,000 years ago, but no one is actually sure. So they really rely on that as an element of how they are different and in many ways superior to the rest of Spain. And then nationalism in the region really arose from economic and political transformations that happened in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, there was very rapid industrialization, so the entire economic system changed. Um, the industrialization encouraged more immigrants to come, so the demographics changed. And it really um, brought up a defense of traditional Basque values that, um, that really fomented itself in the nationalist movement. Um, although currently, Basqueness as kind of an ethnic identifier is actually more connected to the commitment to the nationalist movement. So you can speak the Basque language, have a Basque last name, have grown up in the countryside, and you won't be considered Basque if you don't support the nationalists. So in that way, non-nationalists are considered the enemy, and nationalists are the ones that really define the nation. Um, some of the myths that I've identified through a lot of my research, this is not all-encompassing. There are far more myths that um, the Basque really hold near and dear to their hearts as values and ideologies and principles that they rely on. Um, but these are the ones I identified as really essential to the core cases that I'll be examining. One is the importance of print media. Um, Print media has been well documented as being important in nationalism, and specifically in the Basque case, it has been a way to defend against the linguistic hegemony of the Spanish state and really make sure that Basque as a language is still being used and still being taught. 
Um, the Basques also have different ideas about Spanish democracy, what they want to see and how they want to be represented in a state. Um, obviously for those nationalists who want their own state, that is a very big difference between having representation in the Spanish government and then having their own state. Um, there's also an idea of victimization, that the Basques have been suppressed and victimized throughout their history. Um, this myth arose a lot during the regime of Francisco Franco, who was the dictator um, from the 1930s to the 1970s, and actually forcibly suppressed a lot of expressions of Basque identity. The language couldn't be used, music couldn't be used, no cultural elements at all. And that has really been fostered in this feeling that Basques aren't allowed to express themselves in their state. And then the corollary of that is that the Spanish state itself is an oppressive force who wants to make sure that the Basques don't express their identity and don't represent themselves. And then kind of to sum up what these really suggest is that the Basque nationalists view themselves as distinct, that they are fundamentally different people from the rest of Spain and that is why they should have their own state because they don't fit in. They are different than the Castilians and the Catalans and the Galicians and the Andalusians and they just can't exist in the same state. Um, and I know this is kind of interesting for us to think about because it's not always the first thought on people's mind that Spain, Spain is like a multinational state, but it, it really is. Um, and the Basque region has functioned very differently for many years. Um, so this is just a quick overview of what the European Court of Human Rights is. Um, it was created by the European Convention on Human Rights, which is the main human rights treaty of the Council of Europe, which is um, the organization that encompasses every single state in Europe, including Turkey and Russia and Cyprus. Um, in, uh, the court was actually created in 1959, but it didn't really see that many cases until 1998 when the procedure changed so that individuals could petition directly to the court instead of going through a committee first. Um, so the court has heard about 15,000 cases since that change, which is a huge amount, and luckily the Bass are represented in that, um, in that in those cases. And the European Court of Human Rights is really unique in its right of indiv individual petition. It is the only human rights body in the world that that is a mandatory right, that states must allow individuals to petition directly to the court when they feel that their rights have been violated. <coughs> Um, so the three court cases that I have looked at for my case study are really interrelated, and they all arise out of Sp Spanish anti-terrorism policies in the early 2000s. Um, at this point, there was a large concern, obviously globally, after the 9-11 attacks, but considering that Spain does have homegrown terrorism, they took it as a special concern and really implemented a lot of policies under the government of Prime Minister um, Jose Maria Aznar to counter terrorism and all the funding that goes to terrorist movements to you know, try to completely wipe them out. But unfortunately, these counterterrorism policies allegedly violated a lot of human rights, um, not just the Basque. There were a lot of people in Spain in general who suffered. Um, but in the Basque region, this was specifically, there were raids on newspaper offices, allegations of torture, prohibition of political parties, um, restrictions on freedom of expression that were really supposed to completely stamp out any radical ideology that can lead to, uh, that can lead to terrorism. Um, so the first case that I looked at is the case of Otmendi Iduren versus Spain. Um, Otmendi Iduren was the editor of a Basque daily newspaper called Eos Galden Eduncaria, which is this newspaper here, and you can kind of see how unique the Basque language looks. It doesn't look like any other language in Europe. Um, so he was detained in the raids on his newspaper office. Um, he was put in incommunicado detention and allegedly tortured for several days before being released without any explanation. No charges were filed against him. Um, and then when he tried to bring up these claims of torture, all of the judges in Spain said there wasn't evidence for an investigation. So they decided not to investigate the claims. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the court ultimately decided that there was a violation of his Article 3 rights, which is the prohibition on torture, um, because torture in the European Convention is a non derogable right, which means that under no circumstances ever can a state torture. There is no excuse, no state of emergency at all can ever allow a state to torture individuals. And under that 
obligation as well. The state must investigate whenever there are claims of torture. So that's the part of the right specifically that's being violated by not even trying to investigate and see whether or not torture had occurred. Um, and then the case of Otedi Mondragon versus Spain is related. Uh, Mr. Otedi Mondragon was a radical Basque politician, and he spoke out against the raids on the newspaper offices that had happened and basically called the king of Spain kind of a leader of torturers and fascist police. Um, and under the Spanish criminal code, this is illegal. You cannot insult the king in any way. He is completely protected. Um, so Mr. Otedi Mondragon claimed that his Article 10 rights had been violated. This is the right to freedom of expression and free speech. And he said that he should be able to speak freely, say what he thought. He was using political speech, speaking as a representative. The court ultimately decided with him, saying that, yes, freedom of speech is protected, especially when it is opposition speech and speech that doesn't necessarily conform to the current political system, because that is the type of speech that is necessary in a democratic society to make sure that the democracy is working legitimately. And then the case of Ari Batasuna and Batasuna versus Spain was brought. Um, Ari Batasuna and Batasuna are both radical nationalist parties. Um, Ari Batasuna was created in 1979 and then Batasuna was its successor party created in 2000. And under the same law that the newspaper offices were raided, these two political parties were shut down because of their alleged links to ETA, which is the terrorist organization um, in the Basque region. Um, there was an extensive investigation in Spain done proving that basically these two, two political parties and ETA were one and the same. The, pol the political parties were being funded by ETA. They had the same members. Many of the politicians in these two parties have recently gone to jail because they have participated in bombings and assassinations. Um, so Spain argued that under protection of democracy, banning these political parties is necessary. And ultimately, the court did um, side in favor of Spain. Um, the Article 11 right is the right of association, and they decided it wasn't violated because prohibiting these political parties was necessary and proportionate in a democratic society. Um, so my analysis of the court decisions um, found that in general, the court actually does support a lot of elements of the Basque nationalist movement. Um, notably, they uphold the importance of print media. While the case of Otamendi Edurduren didn't directly deal with print media, the implications and the principles espoused by the court in its decision really talks about how important it is to have a free press. And the newspaper that was raided was the first daily newspaper in Basque, so it held a lot of importance for the Basque people. After the newspaper offices were raided, there were mass protests, um, and it was a really controversial decision, so the court upholds that print media is important and should be inviolable. They also do recognize that the Basque nationalists are victims of Spanish policies and that torture has occurred. Because um, unfortunately in Spain there's kind of a double standard when it comes to recognizing victims in the Basque conflict and that the victims of, say, terrorist bombings have special funds set up for them, special laws protecting them, but officially under Spanish policy, torture doesn't exist. So all the victims of torture and you know prohibiting free speech, those aren't recognized as victims, but the court decided that they are victims and need to be recognized as such. Um, the court also recognized that there are differences in, democ in democratic practices, but not all these differences are legitimate and need to be supported. Um, specifically in the case of Otay de Mondragon, they did support his right to free speech and in criticizing the democratic system and criticizing the king, which is not the democratic system that Spain wanted. But then in the case of Ari Batasuna and Batasuna, they obviously had a very different idea of what democracy means and that it is intricately tied to the violent radical nationalist movement. Um, and the court said this isn't okay, that we do need standards for what democracy is and it can't be terrorism. Um, and then ultimately the court actually made no evaluation on distinctiveness. Um, the case of Otay de Mondragon, in addition to saying that his freedom of expression was violated, he also said that he was a victim of discrimination for being Basque, that his um, speech was prohibited specifically because he was Basque. The court decided it didn't need to evaluate this and so kind of stayed neutral on the topic, so as not to antagonize one or the other. Um, so ultimately my evaluation of the court is 
that it kind of balances between these two ideas of particularism and universalism, which is a critique that's offered by Marie Benedict um, Dembo. Uh, the core balances between these and that sometimes it recognizes that in particular situations there are rights that need to be protected. Um, and this is the case of Ari Batasuna and Batasuna, and that there is a legitimate particular cultural need to prevent terrorism. This might not be the same in other states that political parties say in Norway wouldn't necessarily be prohibited for the same reason, but because Spain has a special interest in preventing terrorism, that is allowed as a right to be um, kind of derogated. Um, and overall what the court does is it discourages radical action while allowing radical ideology because the radical ideology is really a right that can be protected when it's in free speech, but when it culminates in terrorist action, then it's not okay. And there needs to be a balance between the two, and the court really recognizes that. Um, so at this point, I won't speculate on what the future of the Basque nation holds. Um, it could be independence. It could be greater autonomy. And we don't really know right now because it is an emerging international norm that there's the potential for independence. Um, and the court has definitely been a moderator of the conflict in that it has said that in some circumstances, Spanish policies are too extreme and too radical when they come to um, trying to curb some of the elements of Basque nationalism. And it recognizes that there are special rights that the Basque nationalists should have and should be defended at the international level. So whatever happens in the future for the Basque, the court has definitely played a part. So yeah. um, we're going to take another two-minute break, and you guys can switch rooms if you want. Um, we could do an informal question yeah. and answer session, though. While well, switching, yeah. Yeah, this doesn't really take two minutes to walk. That's <laughs> Yeah, Zach? Uh, I was just wondering if the um, courts have talked about drawing the line between, how fine they draw the line between the action ideology, for instance, you know, saying that there should be bombings and then, you know, prohibiting them from happening. Where, where's the line? Yeah, um, in the case of Ari Batasuna and Batasuna, they recognize that any potential for violence um, that isn't okay. Um, because, like I said, Batasuna has only been around since about 2000. So officially, they haven't engaged in any of the violent actions, but because of their ties, there is a very likely potential of that happening, and then that's not okay. Um, but when it really is just limited to speech, then it's okay, because um, Ote de Mondragon, who is the Basque politician, he's actually in prison now on unrelated charges um, because he may have been involved in kidnappings and other activities for ETA. So it, they do draw a fine line, but if it is a likely potential that something violent could happen, then they definitely don't encourage that. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. I, I can't remember exactly what you said, but when you're saying that one of the things that was unusual about this court is that individuals have access to yeah. it, so how, what, as opposed to what? Like, so most other courts, it is an option for individuals to have access. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, the Amer Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Mm -hmm. States can choose whether or not ha um, individuals have access to it. But in the case of the European Court, when they join the Council of Europe and sign the European Convention, they absolutely have to let individuals access the court. And that's the question of like, like is that, does it mean that they don't need to have money or they don't need to have a certain there, Yeah, there are other questions of accessibility, okay. um, but it does mean that if the state in any way tries to prohibit or restrict the right of individuals to get to the court, that is an additional violation in, in addition to you know, whatever rights were violated in the first place. So.